All right, on this episode of Bare Knuckle Radio, very excited to be talking to an individual who competes at BKFC 57 on February the 2nd. Very intriguing fight. Set to go down here with Robbie Peralta, knuckling up and towing the line against Bryce Henry. And great getting to have Bryce on Bare Knuckle Radio. How are you doing, man? You having a solid day so far? Yes, sir, man. Today's, today's going pretty good. What about yourself? Yeah, no, I'm doing well, man, for sure. It just... Yeah, it seems like there's major implications in this next one as far as, like, where the rankings are and stuff like that, just considering you and your opponent are both undefeated, lightweight contenders. Is that something you're feeling heading into February 2nd in a big way? Not really. I, I was going there real comfortable. I don't go in there, like, I don't go in there thinking too much. I was going there and fight, do my job, and get paid. <laughs> Yeah, does that just, like, serve the temperament, just being, like, so super focused on that particular aspect and sort of blocking out the noise, to use a cliche? Not, like, I, I don't know, like, everybody's different. I just go in there real relaxed, like, I don't feed into all the, like, things, like, the media, the people. I just go in there real relaxed, calm. I don't know if I, I don't know, like, I don't know if I've been through a lot at a young age, and it has prepared me for this moment, but I just be real calm. I don't overthink things. Yeah, you have a certain composure in your temperament, for sure. Is that something that you feel has been refined by, like, certain competition and certain just experiences you've had overall in this life? It seems like it benefits you a lot in fighting, but is it something that you've always had within you or maybe something honed in you through fighting? I guess I'm curious on that part. Uh, like, of course, like, you know, as a young age, I've always been, like, calm, relaxed. Of course, I have my little ADHD moments, like, like a little burst of energy, but, like, just growing up, I've just been real relaxed. And then, even with my, my experience, like, I've been through, like, fighting-wise a lot at a young age, being in there with pros and et cetera. And, like, yeah, it is, this fighting shit is just second nature to me. Yeah, because you've been involved in combat sports for so long now i mean around like 60 amateur gloved boxing fights i've seen you kind of mention in certain interviews and you said you would have had even more but it was kind of a byproduct of not as many people wanting to fight you back then as well so yeah it just kind of speaks to you know the depth of experience you had back then but also i guess could have had if some more people were willing to you know step in etc exactly yeah like in my amateur days a lot of people didn't want to fight me because they heard of me like oh this kid is this and that and that's where I kind of got the name Baba Yaga from. A lot of people were like, that was a dude you bring to kill the boogeyman. And I, I, I guess once people got, like, heard that go around, they're like, oh, no, I can't fight this kid. Like, And when they see me at weigh ins, even if they had, like, a fight, like, ready and, like, ready to go, they'll pull the kid out from the fight. Once they see me, I'm like, oh, no. So, yeah, it's a hell of an experience. And that's what made me the person I am today. Yeah, it kind of permeates through a few different interactions. I mean, it kind of seemed to be the case with the most valuable prospects performance you had as well. Like, it seemed like some people were almost interpreting that as an upset, at least some of the source material from the event and everything, putting the, you know, blemish on Pemberton's record there and stuff like that. So I guess that's something you continue to show even nowadays to a certain extent. It was crazy about that fight. I took that fight, like, a week notice. Yeah. So, like... <laughs> Yeah, I played that fight like a week notice, and then, like they told me what to do. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he, he's supposed to be like some Olympic kid. I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Let's do it. Let's run it. So I did that, and yeah, like I guess they're supposed to build that kid. He supposed to be like something, like he supposed to be like really, really good. And I just went there and just made him look like nothing. I guess it really speaks to that prior point we were talking about as well. Like me mentioning the rankings of yourself and your opponent, and you're kind of like, I don't really focus on that as much. Like it seemed like a similar component here like not in a way that would be disrespectful obviously but you're hearing all this about like the stellar amateur credentials and it's like ah you know that's cool i'm still down to fight the guy and i mean a great performance also yeah he's still human man we, we bleed the same thing man <laughs> we both bleed red but yeah kind of a cool journey because i was seeing an interview i believe it was david with david van eiken and you were talking about how like your little brother got you into boxing and you guys were doing it together and you were saying, like, oh, I kind of wanted to quit, but then, like, he motivated you almost to keep going. So, like, I don't want my brother to keep doing this and outshine me. Like, when did you feel like you, I guess, settled into a good run where you're realizing, like, okay, like, I can really do this as a career. Like, this is, like, a lifestyle-minded thing for me. Like, when did things really start, like, clicking together in that sense? It was crazy, crazy. I think what happened. Once I found out, like, you didn't have to go to school, like, for boxing, 
I'll take school. I ain't gonna lie, I hated school. I mean, I was in school, I, I had good grades, you know, graduated 3.7, all that, did all the good things, the right things. But I just hated school. So once I found out, like, oh, like, you could go, like, go pro, you need to go to school, I'm like, okay, like, and then, I don't know, I think, like, I found out something was really wrong with me. Like, I liked hurting people. So that was a plus. So I knew that and that. I'm like, okay, why not? Shit. And plus, yeah, like, you, you bring up the, um, I want to quit thing. Yeah. When I first started boxing, like I said, I got into boxing because of my brother. So I ain't gonna lie, like, first week or first day, I want to quit. And then I seen that he liked it a lot. Like, not even like he loved it. I said, like, shit, I can't let my my younger brother outdo me. So I just stuck with it and I, I found out, like, I really, like, love fighting. Like, I like hurting people. And then plus that not going to school thing was a, a bonus. So why not? Let's do it. No, it's just cool, like, all these different things that have kind of unfolded, too, and everything on the journey. I guess this is even kind of connected to the last fight there, because <clears throat> from what I understood, you actually took a pick with Tom Shove like, years before you even, like, got into Bare Knuckle, really, and then obviously had that standout performance against him in the BKFC fight with those good vibes really continuing along there. So just kind of a curious journey to follow along with for Bryce Henry, it seems like, so far. It's crazy, because, like, that's even before I did Bare Knuckle, or even thought about it. So when I seen him, like, oh, man, like, that dude's, like, good, like, he's, like, one of my favorite people to watch in Bare Knuckle, like, yeah, he's a warrior now, this love warriors. So I seen him, so me, I'm, me and my brother see him backstage when my teammate Howard fought. I said, oh, shit, can we get a picture? I'm like, man, I'm a fan, man. So we took a picture, and then come, down, come to find out, yeah, like, year years later, a year later, we end up fighting, like, that, and that was pretty dope. I ain't gonna lie, dog, like, that's crazy how life works. And sort of like kind of following that linear element we're talking about, I mean, this is a guy that's obviously very experienced and someone you specifically looked up to in Tom Shove, but still didn't let that overwhelm you in a sense and, you know, got it done. So, yeah, kind of that linear thread we've been talking about, it seems like. Of course, man, of course. Like, I, like I said, it is crazy how life works. Like, I, I look up to this guy and, and I fight him. But of course, I, I couldn't let my like emotions get to me. Like I said, I had to stay calm, stay relaxed. Then let the outside get in, and I just went in there head on my dog. Yeah, and we've been talking with all these different opponents about not getting like too preoccupied or overwhelmed about what it might be like to fight them in a certain sense. But I'm curious, like how you maybe go about the tape study because I know some fighters almost allocate that to their coaches more so, and then kind of give them that intel and then some fighters want to focus on the individual refinement and then some fighters are pretty ardent with the tape study like where are you at in terms of your awareness of Robbie Peralta heading into this one it's crazy you say that because like like my coach <laughs> my coach Ryan he forces me like to like watch like study and shit I ain't gonna lie me personally I hate watching I hate watching them because like I don't like watching things I can't learn anything from, like, just, just like school, like, I, I hate being something, it's not, like, intriguing, like, it's not entertaining me, so, like, I don't watch actual fighting, I go and watch, like, you know, you know what anime is, right, yes or no? Yeah, yeah. I go, I'll go and watch that before I go watch real fighting, I don't know why, like, it is entertaining, I like watching, like, it fascinates me, so, like, I just, that's your question, I hate, I hate, I hate watching film, like, I just hate it. So you're like watching Ghost in the Shell before different fights and stuff like that as opposed to like tape on BKFC, I guess? I'll go watch Naruto before I, I go watch a real fighting, bro. Like, I don't know why. Like, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess you could say like real fighting is like, nowadays is like boring to me. Like, like style-wise, nobody like intrigues me. Like, probably about myself, but humbly, but... I don't know. I can't. I can't bring myself to go sit down and watch watch this person, like or that person. I guess there's something too that's kind of almost transcendent about anime, and as far as like how electric the fight scenes are, and I guess with fighting being such a lifestyle thing for you now, maybe like you said, it doesn't give you that same kind of jolt. Whereas something like anime is inherently transcendent of what normal humans can do. So maybe that's what's firing it off. I mean, still kind of fight related, but yeah. Yeah, it's cool, and it seems like the crowd component is something that, I guess, kind of in line with what we're talking about there. Some fighters, maybe, you know, under the bright lights, that's like a deterrent or something that causes them to shrink a little bit, but you seem like you go in the opposite 
direction with that. So, I mean, is that something that you draw particular motivation from, especially heading into such a big show here with the Trent versus Palomino, or the Trout, rather, versus Palomino fight going in BKFC and all? Exactly, like, yeah, like, exactly. I was going there, and then, I don't know, like, anime just bring, it likes, like, not motivate. I, I don't have, like, it's kind of like motivation. I already have discipline, but, like, anime is probably, like, a, that little, that little motivation I probably just need, like, to get, to get in that zone, like, it, man, it's, it's almost that time to just do it, they lock in for real. So, yeah. Yeah, well, fair play, whatever motivates you. I mean, it seems like you have big goals, including, like, winning bare knuckle and gloved boxing gold eventually. So, yeah, I mean, whatever gets it done to motivate that kind of a journey, I suppose. Yes, sir, yes, sir. yes indeed, man. That, that bill is coming soon, man. It's, it's coming soon. And that's kind of a cool component of your situation, I would think, just being able to concurrently fight in both bare knuckle and gloved boxing. Is that a you know cool part of your journey that you're thoroughly enjoying? It seems like BKFC largely allows for those outside opportunities if things jive together and all. Of course. I'm actually starting to be the first person like ever in history to have a bare knuckle belt and boxing belt at either at the same time or be the first person to do it, like have a, a, a belt in both. It don't have to be at the same time, but I'm going to try to be the first person at the same time if they let me. Yeah, it's funny, I was just talking to Austin Trout a bit earlier, like about an hour ago or so, and it seems like he's got a similar idea in mind, so it'll be interesting to see you guys kind of vying for that and everything and all. Hey, cool guy, very much respect to Austin Trout, man. Shout out to him. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely a talented fighter, and yeah, that Palomino fight's going to be incredible as well like obviously you're squarely focused on this fight but i mean you are in the lightweight division and palomino is also the lightweight champion is there a certain peripheral awareness of this main event fight between luis palomino and austin trout at all um like i don't know because like, i i don't really really try to like worry about other guys like i just try to stay focused on me like i mean you know, he probably me has the belt, and I have, I have to get, I have to get him to get the belt. But I don't think he's going to stay at 155. So I might have to go chase him to go to 155. Say if he win, I might have to go chase. I might have to chase him at 65 to go grab that belt too. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, it looks like you're ranked in both divisions, so it seems like you have options for that upward mobility for a title shot. So yeah, good to have options, I suppose. Why not? Why not be a two-time, two-way champion? <laughs> and I'm kind of curious because I mentioned the you know, regular rate of activity with both gloved boxing and bare knuckle. I'm curious how different your bare knuckle approach is, both in terms of like the training leading in and within the actual body of the competition. Like I would think there's certain things you could transfer over from gloved boxing, but like what unique kind of attributes and I guess elements do you need to bring to a BKFC effort? I think pretty much I think both are like they're really like they're really like close the only difference is like you could like work in the clinch like like grab the one hand and still punch with the other so I, I train the same for, for both actually so like when I train I don't train just for one fighter I train for all type of fighters just in case I have a plan A plan B plan A through Z so I, I pretty much plan, like train the same for both but I can say I'm more aware way more aware in bare knuckle because you know you get sliced real easy like cut so you know it's bare knuckle so try to be aware way more and be on my toes some more yeah it would probably help too that you have like one of the better jabs and everything like that it would seem like that is a big thing it seems like the lead weapons are a big part of bkfc i mean a lot of variables for sure but it seems like within bare knuckle like even certain blows that you could maybe quote unquote take within gloved boxing a lot of fighters are finding that if they take that in like a bare knuckle context even if it's a glancing blow it can create a fight ending sort of cut so yeah i mean i would think that having a weapon like that would really behoove you and really be of great benefit to you and all it's crazy because like you said that like a lot of people like yeah like the, the jab a lot of people don't realize the jab is the most important punch in the like fighting game but a lot of people don't use it in bare knuckle so like that's why i probably have a more uh, probably more leverage. <laughs> I know because I'm tall and long, but like 
A lot of people don't use the jab, and I'm one of the top people who use the jab a lot. Yeah, for sure. It's cool. And correctly. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool to see. It's like, I mean, I was follow, I've been following Bare Knuckle for a while now, and it seems like in the last couple of years, few years, there's been such a refinement in the fight IQ and the technical application. I mean, in a certain sense, I mean, certain things can grow and change. Like maybe, like you said, perhaps we should see more of the jab going forward, but it's just been interesting to kind of see a certain fight IQ and different methodologies develop for Bare Knuckle. It's pretty cool. I mean, it must be fun for you kind of being at the center of a sport like this that's kind of like rapidly evolving and all. Yeah, especially at a young age, like, and like, it's crazy because I predicted this, like, even before I started it, like, I knew I was going to be, like, quote-unquote, like, the shit when, like, when I first started, like, because I knew, like, my style, my, I know my, like, my style, like, my fighting IQ is very high, it's different from a lot of guys, so I knew I was going to be, like, lit as soon as I got in there, and I just, it, you see, it, it, it happened. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's been a cool journey to follow so far, man. And I guess one of the last questions that I wanted to touch on, like maybe this is kind of rooted in some of the earlier stuff we're talking about where maybe you don't even allocate any thought towards this. But I know certain fighters who sometimes get into the whole visualization sort of thing and kind of have a predominant visualization for how their upcoming fight is going to end. Is that something you think of at all? Or is it kind of staying in that adaptability-minded kind of flow state and kind of seeing what presents itself in the fight, on the fight night, more so? It's kind of both. Like, I I, pre- like, I predicted, like, which way he could go. Like, either he could be on his heel, he could fall on his face on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, like, I have a, like I said, I have a plan A through Z, so, like, if he comes aggressive, if he fights on his back foot, I, I know what punch I'm going to knock him out with. I know, or stop, stop him with. It probably be like I could either knock him out, the, the doctor could stop it, or the fucking his corner could stop it. Like I literally like planned, like planned it in my head. And even if, even if it go all five rounds, I like planned it in my head how it's gonna go. But then again, I know shit could go left real quick, so I had that at the back of my mind. So like, yeah, like have have more plans. So so I, I, I I'll, I'll say yes, like both. No, that's a fair way to break it down, man. I get what you're saying in that sense. Just, yeah, such an exciting fight coming up here. But in wanting to be mindful of your time and schedule, Bryce, I'm kind of curious if maybe there's a final thought you'd want to add as we're sort of wrapping things up here, man. Um, You know, first, I'd like to thank you for having me today. Um, I thank all my sponsors and I thank God, my friends, family, fans. And it's going to be a hell of a show, man. Yeah, really excited for BKFC 57. This is a pretty stacked card on February 2nd, I think. And one of the fights that really stood out to me was your Robbie Peralta fight. So in mentioning that, thanks so much for coming on Bare Knuckle Radio, Bryce. I'm looking forward to checking out this fight when it goes down. But until then, you have a good rest of your day, man. And yeah, thank you so much for the time. No problem, man. You too. Thank you for having me. Have a blessed one.